in Mexico, and he, in, in part because of him, uh, the, this the Colegio de Frontera uh, Norte in, in Tijuana has become one of the major centers of, of the study of migration in Mexico, even better than Vietnam, better than Mexico. Uh, I mean, it helps that you are writing, right. right what is happening, right? Uh, and today he's going to tell us about the uh, what is happening on the other side of the border. Because not only Central America, but for a long time uh, now, Cubans used to go also to Central America, Chinese, people from Africa. So Tijuana has become the center where they wait to see if they can get asylum or cross the border. And we don't know exactly what is happening, but in the United States, but actually in Mexico, it's becoming more and more a critical issue. And an issue that seems to be at the moment also uh, further for demagogic policies and arguments. So we're very eager to find out what is happening on the other side of the border. And Rafael is the perfect person to tell us about the next. Thank you very much, Jose, for the, this, the nice, this nice introduction. And uh, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for attending this presentation. I know that this is not the best week to attend uh, this kind of presentation, but thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I was here in 2014, and I presented uh, a lecture about uh, also the border, the US-Mexico border, but regarding the deportees from the United States to Mexico. So today, we're, I'm going to talk about a different flow, the flow from the south to the north, that is uh, <clears throat> uh, asylum seekers trying to uh, to enter the United States. And I really like this poster, so I, I, I wanted to just use it because that sort of shows what is really happening in that part of the, of the world. Uh, I live in Tijuana, Tijuana, Baja California, in Mexico, which is located on the one side with that beautiful Pacific Ocean, and then the San Diego County, and then the desert to the south. It's a very, very ugly city, that's the truth, but very, very interesting. That's why we, don't, we never get bored, because there is always things happening regarding migration. And it's the most traversed city in the world. A lot of people cross the border in both, both ways, mainly because, as you know, Southern California, including the counties of San Diego, Orange, and Los Angeles, are the main concentration for, for, the, for the Mexican immigrants. So that's why Tijuana is so important. OK, so let's uh, first, oh, and I have to say that uh, in 2014, <laughs> I got a fellowship from uh, Barnard College from Columbia University. Now I'm an art fe visiting fellow at CUNY. So five years <coughs> later, I got another fellowship in New York. That's why I'm here. Uh, I don't think that this one, uh, I'm gonna be able to get another fellowship in five years, but if I can, I'll be here too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, first, let me give you the, little, let's talk about a little bit the context. Interestingly, uh, Tijuana and other Mexican border cities are receiving large numbers of uh, migrants from Central America, but also from many different countries of the world who are arriving to the, to the border to apply for asylum. And this is in the context in which the Mexican population in the United States is declining. So this is something that was observed by the Pew Research Center uh, many years ago, but the trend continues. So there are fewer and fewer Mexicans living in the US as a result of fewer uh, Mexican undocumented migrants. This is something that we haven't Resolve. Why do we have why we have fewer Mexicans arriving to the US? I have some hypotheses. But in addition to this, we have 
large numbers of Mexicans returning from the United States to Mexico. But most of them are they return because they are deported. So that, in my opinion, that explains most of the decline of the Mexican population in the US. So this is the context. Fewer Mexicans cr crossing the border. And then in 2000, uh, starting in 2014, we saw a new process taking place with the uh, crisis of the unaccompanied children. So large numbers of children from Central America who arrived to the Mexican border towns, especially in Texas, in order to apply for asylum. And I'm gonna give you, uh, I'm gonna give you a, a general overview of the processes and policies implemented by the U.S. in Mexico. So first we have the unaccompanied minors crisis. As I said, taking place especially in the border of Texas. So suddenly, suddenly, from one year to another, uh, we saw this uh, arrival of large number of migrants coming especially from Central America. Uh, remember that was the Obama years, so they tried to implement a lot of measures to stop this process. And then, uh, especially in Tijuana, we saw another interesting process, the arrival of large numbers of migrants from Haiti coming to Tijuana. And we were so surprised in 2016 to see those Haitians waiting on the ports of entry in order to be interviewed by asylum uh, officers. That started in May with large numbers of Haitians. And then in, in September, oh, that was because the, uh, they were not coming directly from Haiti. They came from Brazil. Because after the earthquake in 2010, Brazil offered uh, work visas for Haitians. So that's explain why they went to Haiti to Brazil. They worked there for a few for a few years. Remember that Brazil had the Olympic Games and then the World Cup. But after that, large numbers of Haitians decided to go all the way to Tijuana and other border cities to apply for asylum. And in those years, after the uh, earthquake, the uh, Department of Homeland Security decided not to deport Haitians. That also explains the, la the large number of Haitians who decided to apply for asylum. But the process started around May 2016, but on September 22nd, the Department of Homeland Security resumed deporting Haitians again. And then we, I, we, I saw that the large decline in the numbers of Haitians coming because they were afraid of being deported if their application was not uh, accepted. Then we have the zero tolerance policy of uh, President Trump in which uh, they separated children from their parents, around 2,500 children. And then the caravans, those uh, large numbers of people leaving Central America and coming again to border cities. But the, the, their <clears throat> idea was to come in large numbers in order to protect themselves on their way to, to Tijuana and other cities. Because as you know, Mexico is a very dangerous country. So their idea was to uh, come in large numbers in, in order to protect themselves. Then, uh, in, in the beginning of 2019, the United States government implemented this migrant protection protocols by which the, the 
US government returns people who apply for asylum after the first interview at the ports of entry. They say, okay, uh, we're going to process your uh, application, uh, but you have to go back to Tijuana and wait there. And your next appointment is in two months. So that, that is the, the, the migrant protection protocols, and I will talk more about this later. Then in around June, due, due to the pressure of President Trump, of President Lopez Obrador, he finally decided to stop migrants, Central American migrants, on their way to the United States. That was <coughs> a terrible, terrible situation because many people thought that Mexico never uh, was uh, forced to do that. That's not exactly true, but there was a contradiction because Lopez Obrador is a sort of leftist president and he didn't have the, uh, he didn't want to uh, oppose or he didn't want to fight President Trump or do something else. So they started President uh, Lopez Obrador ordered the National Guard to start uh, stopping uh, migrants on their way to the United States. And that continues today. Then uh, another interesting thing about the inter International Organization for Migration is that in September 2019, a few weeks ago, basically, the, this uh, UN organization got a lot of money, $1.6 million, to offer uh, bus tickets, even plane tickets, to Central America to go back to their countries of uh, nationality. The idea of this, uh, and th this is uh, uh, a strategy that the, the interna International Organization for Migration implements in different parts of the world. The interesting thing is that here, this organization is using money from the US government to, uh, not to deport, but to invite people to go back to Central America. Finally, finally, the Wall Street Journal reports that the Remain in Mexico program, or the uh, Migrant Protection Protocols, it's the same, uh, has sent back 47,000 migrants, mainly Central America. Almost 50,000 migrants from Central America now live in different border cities. And I will talk about a little bit about their conditions. So this is just a general overview of these processes regarding asylum seekers. Well, just a, a few definitions. I know that Professor David Fitzgerald is also <coughs> who's our friend, was here and talk about this. But just, uh, uh, as you know, uh, 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 the definition of a uh, refugee comes from the United, United Nations 1951 Convention and the 1967 Protocols. And you know this, the definition that is in there. However, in the case of the United States, as you know, there, there, there is a very interesting process because there is a distinction between refugees and asylum seekers. They are different. And uh, both eventually can become legal permanent residents. So that is a very important uh, uh, definition because that shows that there is a, a, a reason to apply for asylum or for refugee status because eventually uh, you can become a legal permanent resident. Let's talk about a little bit about the definition of refugees. The important thing is that refugees apply for uh, uh, refuge from outside the United States, generally from 
transition country. So generally, they are not in the country of nationality, their nationality, because probably they are uh, being uh, persecuted or they have uh, fear because of different reasons, as either race or because they belong to a, a special group. And is, there is a, a limitation in the numbers of refugees that are admitted every year. And that is a, the decision of the president in consultation with Congress. As you can expect, uh, under the Trump administration, the refugee ceiling uh, went fall, uh, fell from 110, 110,000 in 2007 to only 18,000 in two, uh, 2020. So as you can see, this is something that President Trump can do, and, and he has reduced substantially the number of refugees that can be admitted to the United States. Now let's see about asylum seekers. They may apply at the port of entry at the time they seek admission or within one year of arriving in the United States. So that's why this is a very powerful incentive for people to go to cities like Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez because they can apply for asylum there. And uh, remember, I remember that Professor Fitzgerald mentions in his lecture that sometimes it's difficult to define where the United States territory starts. So that is a, 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 a problem also in the, on, in the US Mexican border, but people can apply in ports of entry for asylum. And, and I'm following the definition of the American Immigration Council. I think that they made a mistake in, uh, I, in red. I, also add that you can also apply for asylum between ports of entry. That's the, the, the definition of the Homeland Security Department. That means when people cross the border illegally and inside the United States, they surrender to the Border Patrol and they apply for asylum. So as you can see now, people can apply for asylum in ports of entry, but also crossing the border illegally. And also people who arrive to the United States and they can apply uh, within one year of arrival. That's why uh, I would say that this is a very powerful uh, reason for, for people to come to the border. And that's why since 2014, we have seen these different flows asylum seekers. Another interesting uh, thing is that there is no limit in, in the number of asylum seekers that can be admitted every year. So different from the, the other system. For instance, in, in the <coughs> 2017, 26,000 uh, asylum seekers were admitted. What about the chances of people applying for asylum according to nationality? Okay, first, here we have uh, the Mexicans, Haitians, Salvadorians, uh, people from Honduras, Guatemala, Somalia. As you can see, in, in 2017, between 2012 and 2017, 88% of the applications from uh, Mexicans were denied. 86% uh, of Haitians, 79% of uh, people from El Salvador, 78% from Honduras, Guatemala. And only 17% of people from Ethiopia and 20% from China. So I, I don't have the, an the answer to this to these differences. Of course, the political situation of, of the country is very, very important. But there is an interesting thing that 
the, the researchers at Syracuse University mentioned is that having an attorney increases the probability of obtaining asylum. So probably a little bit of investment in, in, in a lawyer can uh, get you uh, uh, an asylum uh, uh, application uh, or acceptance. This is the same data, the number of cases of affirmative asylum cases granted in 2018, only by, with all nations, Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico. In the case of Mexico, as you can see, it's around 10%. Uh, in the case of Guatemala, a little bit uh, higher, but around 20%. So very, very low uh, percentages of, uh, of cases are admitted from Mexico and Central. So, and people know that, people know that, but they still have the hope that at least in their case, they will be uh, admitted. <coughs> and for instance, when there was a, a huge caravan in October 2018, we interviewed some people in the main, uh, uh, Refuge shelter. shelter, sorry, my Spanish is good. Oh, in the main shelter, I interviewed a woman from Honduras, and I wanted to know uh, the reason for her to apply for asylum. And she told me in perfect Spanish, I will present that in good time. So she didn't say anything, but because they don't want people to, they, they keep their, their their information information very uh, secret, and that is the case with many different with many different uh, uh, asylum seekers. Okay, a little bit. Let me just show you some photographs about the Haitians in two thousand Tijuana in two thousand sixteen. First, as I told you before, they had to travel all the way from Brazil and they had to go through Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua. They always say that uh, people in Nicaragua were very harsh. It was difficult for them to cross Nicaragua. Then Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico. And Mexico is a huge country. So going from Chiapas all the way to Tijuana is difficult and dangerous. So they had to go all they have to cross all these countries in order to reach the U.S.-Mexico border. And there was a crisis in, in Tijuana because of the large numbers of Haitians who arrived. That is a shelter, the <coughs> Desayunador del Padre Chava. And as you can see, there are hundreds of Haitians waiting to uh, get a document from the Mexican Immigration Office, Mexican Immigration Office. What they wanted to get was uh, what they call in Spanish, an oficio de salida, which is a kind of a contradiction, which, because they are getting the, so that is a document that entitles uh, foreigners in Mexico to spend 20 days in Tijuana and then leave. And they get this oficio de salida. Many people get this document in Chiapas. So they have to really, really hurry to cross the border from Chiapas to, to Tijuana. And the Mexican government provided this document to many patients. And another very, very interesting uh, 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 aspect, patients were welcome. People really, really wanted to help them, and there was a lot of solidarity for them because they were, they were in a very difficult condition. As you can see, this is the street because there, were, there was no, there were no uh, 
shelters in Tijuana because they were full of people. So they had to go and sleep on the streets. <coughs> and as I mentioned before, on September 22nd, 2016, the Secretary of uh, the Department of Homeland Security mentioned that uh, they just in red, the situation in Haiti has improved, according to him, sufficiently to permit the U.S. government to remove Haitian nationals on a more regular basis. So that means that they continue to deport Haitians, and that basically stopped the process. However, uh, there are like around 3,000 Haitians who stay in Tijuana. And now they are part of the Tijuana society. They don't have good jobs. Many of them sell the things on the street. They work in different places. But they, they, uh, they are ready to stay. And they, as I mentioned before, there was a lot of solidarity for them. Now, <clears throat> yes. Good question. Uh, the number of the, the number of refugees in Mexico has grown rapidly because many of these Haitians and people from other nationalities have applied for uh, refugee status in Mexico. So yeah, many of them have uh, this refugee status, but uh, but for instance, the Central Americans do not want to stay. Now the migrant caravans in Tijuana uh, and the migrant protection programs. I don't know what you think, but uh, in the beginning of the Lopez Obrador administration, the president wanted to show that, like Brazil, that Mexico was a place, a friendly place for migrants. And since the, since the start, uh, they began to distributing uh, cars for visitors for humanitarian reasons in Chile. 10,000 or 15,000. And uh, he, he was the, the, the secretary of the immigration uh, uh, department in Mexico. Politically, of course, that was uh, a good, uh, Lopez Obrador had a very good image that he was helping migrants. <coughs> the problem is that that encouraged more and more people to try to, to, to come to Chiapas and go all the way to Tijuana and other places. So they immediately stopped this policy and began to uh, close the border. Because now the flow was mainly from Central America. And uh, there were some problems because one day they destroyed one of the gates in Chiapas, and that was, uh, of course, uh, uh, considered by many Mexicans like something rude. <coughs> and there, the uh, uh, sentiment, anti, anti Central American sentiment began to develop. Uh, contrary to what happened to the Haitians. I mean, I am not saying that every Mexican was against the Central American, but there were, there were groups who, who, who uh, exposed their opposition to the arrival of Central Americans. And then the Mexican government began to detain uh, Central Americans, and because uh, Trump began to put pressure on them. And uh, they began to detain more and more Mexican migrants until uh, the secretary of the Mexican uh, Immigration Department was fired by Lopez Obrador. He was actually a colleague of mine, a professor. Uh, he was the president of the Colegio de la Frontera. And he was very happy that after 10 years of being the president of Colegio de la Frontera, then got another job as the director of the Institute.
Instituto Nacional de Migración de México, but he was fired and he was substituted by a policeman, someone who knows about, about how to uh, repress people, and he is now, this person is now in charge of the National Institute of Migration in Mexico. So the policy is completely different, and now is not friendly to migrants. And then we start with the uh, migrant protection protocols. So the definition of this is that uh, the people, people who arrive to the US from Mexico illegally or without proper documentation may be returned to Mexico and wait outside of the United States. That is the migration uh, protection protocol. According to the US government, it is based on uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act, or Article Section 235 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And the rationale, the justification, is that there was a different profile of uh, illegal migrants crossing the border. According to, their, to them, in the past, illegal, illegal aliens were predominantly single adult males from Mexico who were removed within 48 hours. Now, over 60% are family units and unaccompanied children, and 60% are non residents. Of course, Children and women require <coughs> special uh, care uh, uh, compared to single uh, males. So that, that, that's the argument that now they have a lot uh, of things to, <coughs> to, they have to take care of children and, and women, and that's why they wanted to stop this process. Then, uh, according to them, they, most of the people that they detain, they still remain in the United States. And that's why there is a, a case backlog in the migration courts, near 800,000, 800, 800, that's the back, case backlog. As a result of that, the idea was, okay, you came to Mexico, okay, we're going to interview you, and uh, you're gonna go back to Mexico and stay there until we call you for the second uh, interview. And I'm gonna use uh, data from uh, Casa de Migrante in Tijuana, which is a shelter uh, funded by the Ca Catholic Church, the Escalabrian missionaries. And uh, I have to say that my wife Macrina and my son Francisco helped me in the interviews with these migrants at Casa del Migrante. This shelter was founded in 1987 by the Scalabrinian missionaries that uh, are part of the Catholic Church. Uh, and actually, I wanted to mention that the current director is Father Pat Murphy, who is a native New Yorker. So, a native New Yorker. This beautiful city now living in Tijuana. Uh, and in 32 years, Casa de Migrante has served more than 260,000 migrants. So they are really, really busy with migrants coming from different flows. <coughs> okay, now people who are stay at Casa de Migrante are deportees from the US, Mexican deportees, for asylum seekers. In 2017, Casa del Migrante offered shelter to migrants from more than 25 countries. So not only Central America, not only Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, but 25 different countries. So as you can see, Tijuana is an international city because we see, see people from Armenia, Benin, Brazil, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Congo, Cuba, Costa de Marfil, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Togo, Romania, etc. Those are people who come to Tijuana to apply for asylum. 
they, they don't want to stay in Mexico. They just want to apply for asylum in the United States. And this is a photograph from Casa del Migrante. This is a, 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 a this uh, shelter is uh, supported by uh, voluntary work between different people and also by the support from people from Tijuana. They don't get, now with Lopez Obrador, they don't get any money because as you know, President Lopez Obrador does not uh, provide money for organizations. If the government wants to help people, they deliver the money directly to the person. So this is a very interesting uh, institution in Tijuana that sort of portrays the uh, image of Tijuana as a city of immigrants. Like for instance, I was not born in Tijuana and now I am an immigrant living in Tijuana, so that's, that's, that's the way Tijuana. Now, I wanna show you this form from the Mexican Immigration Department to one of the uh, migrants who were uh, returned to Mexico. I know that it's very difficult to read and we, we cannot see the name, but this is a forma migratoria multiple. It's a the migration form. And according to this, this person was considered uh, they, they were, this is the most important thing. They can stay uh, a maximum of 180 days. That is six months, right? But in this case, the <laughs> officer only uh, provided 75 days. And then there are three other uh, status, status for the migrants. One is a vis a visitor with no uh, employment term permit. Visitor with employment permit or visitor for humanitarian visitor. Clearly, clearly, and that was the that was the uh, negotiation between the U.S. and Mexico governments. Mexico was going to provide uh, employment permits for the uh, return migrants. But in this particular case, he was not considered a visitor for humanitarian reasons. So this young Guatemalan who, 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 who we interviewed had to depend on his work on the uh, informal labor market in Tijuana and also on the uh, assistance of uh, shelters like Casa de so uh, the people from Tijuana were supporting those uh, return migrants from the United States, not the Mexican government. That was uh, that interview was conducted at the end of January 2019, and then uh, uh, on June uh, 2019, this is another uh, form. But now, as you can see, the agent identified the migrant for uh, humanitarian reasons. And he provided 120 days. So that means that the policy changed because now the government, the <coughs> federal government, is providing these uh, 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 permits and then they can apply for a human, uh, visa for humanitarian reasons that allows them to work. So things are changing, but uh, it took them like six months. And remember, now we are there are almost nearly fifty thousand uh, Central American migrants waiting for the processes in, in Mexico, in, in the United States. Well. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, the International Organization for Migration is also offering these free tickets for buses or airplanes. So, in my opinion, the idea <coughs> is sort of to is is to make people decide to go back 
to Guatemala or, or Honduras and forget about the, the, the application for asylum. Because many of the people who have returned, they, they finally decided to uh, stop uh, not to apply, for, well, if they were in the process of waiting for another interview, they just decided to abandon this and, and go back to, to Cuba. Final considerations. I have three final considerations. I think that uh, the Mexican government, even though they don't want to do that, but in my opinion, is contributing to the erosion of the asylum system of the United States. And because Mexico is helping the US government with this process. And the process basically discourages people from applying for asylum. That's the idea, to make it so difficult for them to uh, apply for asylum. Uh, again, the number of refugees Mexico has grown very, very rapidly, and now there are a lot of refugees in Mexico, but most of them, they do not want to stay in, in Mexico. So I, I have a question. Are the MTPs a way by which civil society in Mexico and overseas are paying, for, are paying for Trump's invisible war? In my opinion, <laughs> The Juanenses, including me, are paying for this, for this war, because now we donate money to Casa del Migrante, and that is the invisible war. Trump doesn't have to build uh, the wall, because now the, this program is working as, a, as an invisible war. And finally, this is not, we have to uh, be clear that uh, the, uh, administration, this is not, not the first time that uh, a Mexican administration is collaborating with the United States government. All of the governments have collaborated in the contention of migrants from Central America. The only difference, according to Professor Ficheras, is that they, 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 have to do, they have to do it silently. Like we say in Mexico, in law obscurito, in this little dark place where nobody knows anything. But in the particular case of the Lopez Obrador administration, they are doing this openly with the opposition of many, many Mexicans. And uh, so I want to stop here and thank you for, for your attention. Yes, this clarification, this uh, the IOM, IOM is paying for uh, passage from Tijuana back to Central America. To Honduras. Uh, uh, how do they distribute this? Uh, uh, are there more, more people willing to take it than resources, or vice versa? <laughs> they have done that, this before. So now they have 1.6 million. When they spend all this money, then the program stops because there's more money. So. They, they did it before with the deportees, Mexican deportees. But yeah, it, it is money very important for the state department. And the other thing that I was going to say, that I see graphs of what proportion of Central Americans were deported from the United States and what proportion from Mexico. And some years back, I, mean, I don't remember exactly, but 15 years ago, there was a whole period, almost a decade, that 90% were being deported from Mexico, not from the United States. Is, I think it's, it's the opposite. Before, most most deported Central Americans uh, came from the United States. But a few years ago, that changed. And now, Mexico deports more Central Americans than the United States. Yeah, no, this one was older. So there might be been another period in which that was the case. Because they, I remember it, that it was mostly uh, Mexico So I can we will have a chat show you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your report. I have a question about um, the process of going in and coming back out, the MPP. So first, the first 
uh, application for asylum, the first uh, credible fear test, that's the metering, right? Where they first show up and then they only let in, I think, 30 or 40 people a day. Then they go back, they're sent back to Mexico for two months and they go back for another. So what is the two months when they go back? What is the next step? Because usually the, the process for an asylum hearing could be several years. So what are they doing when they go back in two months? Okay. First, Thank you. Uh, we are not sure, and the lawyers from, uh, from different organizations in San Diego are not sure if in all these, uh, in all cases, the first interview is the credible fear interview. In some cases, it seems that it's just uh, uh, an interview to collect data. They do not conduct the, the credible fear interview that is part of the asylum process. So in the first case with the, uh, that young man from Guatemala who we interviewed, in my opinion, according to the interview, he didn't have a credible fear uh, interview. And the problem is that uh, many people think that, uh, oh, the next interview in two months is gonna be with a judge. But what happens is not with a judge, it's with another uh, asylum officer in the United States. And you, uh, you mentioned metering. This is another important part of the process because uh, asylum officers do not interview many people every day. Like you said, 40 or 50 a day. So the process is very low. And in the case of Tijuana, the migrants themselves organized a system, a list in which they, they used to have some order in the interview. They have a number, exactly. However, however, now the Mexican government is controlling this list and there is corruption. So if someone pays a large amount of money, instead of being probably number 465, it becomes number 15. So definitely there is corruption with the metric system. Thank you so much. I was wondering if there's been a spike in people applying for asylum in Mexico, and if in Central, Central American migrants applying to stay permanently in Mexico, if, that, if that's happened since MPP, or if that's ever a possibility. Well, definitely there is a, a spike. There's more and more people are applying. We, we, don't, we, we, we don't call it uh, asylum in Mexico. We call it refuge, refugio. Uh, oh, by the way, the only person who received a political asylum was Evo Morales. <laughs> Evo Morales. But most people within Mexico apply for refuge. I don't have the numbers, but definitely the number of people applying for uh, refugee status in Mexico has grown very rapidly. And the Comar, which is the government office in charge of this does not have the resources to uh, interview many people. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, question to you, Erica. Do, do, do you have data of what proportion of these petitions, these applications to Mexico are being granted? Th there is data on that, but I, I don't have it. Yes. Actually, um, I took a class with Professor Frankie. I don't know if you've met her. She's on um, at the law school, and she worked with El Dorado for a while, oh. which is based in Tijuana. And she told us that um, there is a lot of discrimination happening concerning those lists. That people who work and who check out the list sometimes will skip names or will just simply cross them off depending on where they come from. Um, do you have any more information about that? Thanks, thanks for, for the information because al otro lado is a, a lawyers organization, US lawyers uh, who belong to this organization and they work with migrants in, in Tijuana. And of course there is a problem with that because the US government 
accuses them of practicing law uh, illegally because they, they are supposed to practice law in the US but in Mexico. But yeah, a lot of law has helped a lot, a lot of violence. And uh, you talk about discrimination. Yeah, probably, probably uh, uh, there, there is that on the part of the Mexican government officials who work with this. But I would say that, uh, yeah, probably discrimination, but mainly corruption, money, to go, uh, to be placed in, the, uh, in a good number for the country. Thanks for your question because it just clarifies. Uh, uh, I'm gonna try to clarify this. Before the <coughs> Lopez Obrador administration took over the government, there were discussions between U.S. government officials and Lopez Obrador officials, and they were talking about this. But the idea, as you know, is that. Uh, the Trump administration wanted Mexico to become a third safe country. Third safe country. So that means that every asylum seeker who arrives to Mexico has to apply for asylum in Mexico. And that is a, a, a perfect solution for the United States because then when they come to the, to the border, they are going to say, but, but you have to apply in Mexico because you are, you are in Mexico. Lopez Obrador uh, and his uh, of it, uh, government officials resisted that. And they said, no, we're not going to become a uh, third safe country. And, and I think they're right, because Mexico, number one, is not a safe country. So it's, it's a contradiction. So in, in order not to become a third safe country, they decided to do this, which is uh, sort of uh, the same, but without the status of a safe third country. And the Mexican government claims that this was a una unilateral decision of the United States. But they agreed to do that. Even though it was unilateral, they agreed to do this. And, and, and you're asking about if they're going to be a, a count, accountable for this. I don't know. It's uh, probably, I'm not a lawyer. The specialist on, 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 on this can, can say if there is something that they can do about this. Thanks. Thank you. 
rural population and scaling. Uh, the numbers that we discussed was 70% of the state asyl asylum seekers in, in Juarez uh, were from Cuba. Those numbers have been changing, but it's still very high. So it's in reduction. That's, that's a question I have. We don't deserve a social sanction imagine. Thanks, Annie, for the information because this is uh, information that uh, I, don't, I didn't have about Cubans applying for asylum in Ciudad Juarez. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is that you mentioned that these are the poorest Cubans. So probably the other Cubans who had the support of their relatives in the United States go to Tijuana or other cities. The problem with the Cubans is that they, there is this general perception in Mexico that all of them have wealthy relatives in Miami. And that's why they are more likely victims of uh, bad people because they can uh, what you call kidnap, kidnap them and ask for money from the United States. That's the problem with the Cubans. I don't know if you found Yes, I, I was actually, I visited several shelters, and I was in one of the shelters, but Pastor Barraza shelter, that is mostly welcoming, uh, in this case, male, Cuban males. Another interesting thing, that is a lot of the remaining Cubans, in many cases, are single people or, or male, male population, that is actually trying to get jobs, etc. But it's a new situation. I have never seen a good explanation, and I wonder if there's any perhaps ethnographic work about this, explaining the 2014 surge of unaccompanied minors and children. We know why people are fleeing, but we also know that people didn't start beating their wives in 2014, and they didn't do it in 2012, right? I mean, domestic violence is one of the reasons people come. The gangs didn't suddenly appear in 2014, right? So I'm curious, I mean, I've heard speculation that um, the, uh, the surge in asylum seekers of these families and children can be explained by patterns in uh, the trafficking of people across borders and that the traffickers sort of figured out that asylum was a good way of uh, getting especially vulnerable people across the border um, more cheaply and that explains why people suddenly, well, there's this uptick of people asking for asylum, but I'm curious if there's any research on that or if people have written about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't think that many people have conducted a good eth ethnographic work, even with the caravanas. Uh, uh, some colleagues of mine at the Colegio La Frontera not conducted a survey, but just uh, and as you know, general data. Question is, uh, it's difficult to answer because they easy answer would be, well, like the Trump administration argues, they are just taking advantage of the asylum system. Since asylum can be for, people can apply for asylum at the border, then they, they know that they can do that as well as they do that. That could explain the search of the unaccompanied uh, minors. But uh, who knows? Because at the same time, uh, conditions in, in Central America are terrible. Conditions, oh, and I have to add, not only Central Americans apply for asylum, but also Mexicans, especially for two states, Guerrero and Michoacán. Remember Guerrero? Guerrero is the state where where Ayotzinapa is located, where the 43 students disappeared. So this is something that embarrasses the Mexican government because these Mexicans are applying in Ciudad Juarez and other places. And the Chavizal is. And then you mentioned another interesting thing. 
As you know, the definition of, of silo comes from the 1950s, and, and that is the effect of the, uh, of the war. And of course, now uh, most uh, people who apply for uh, uh, asylum from Central America argue that they, they want to apply asylum because of gang violence or domestic violence. So do asylum officers consider that as a valid reason for that? Maybe. Uh, I forgot the name of another professor from CUNY, a female professor, I will remember that, sorry, who told me that women who claim uh, domestic violence are considered members of a special group. That's why asylum officers uh, accept their application. But, uh, Sessions eliminated domestic violence. Thank you, thank you. But uh, so, so you think that they do not consider any domestic violence as a as a main reason for as a reason? Definitely, in my opinion, this uh, program was designed to, to dissuade people from continuing the application or to never apply. So it's definitely, and I think that it has been very successful because now fewer and fewer migrants from Central America arrive to Mexican cities. So, but. The problem is that the asylum system in the U.S. is being what, destroyed or limited. Outsourced. Outsourced to Mexico, actually. Outsourced. Uh, 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 thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm just wondering, because the U.S. has signed the 1951 Convention, but they have not ratified it. So, do you think that if they have signed the convention, like separating the child from the rest of the family or outsourcing, affecting, effectively outsourcing asylum to Mexico would be permitted? If they have ratified the convention? Because right now they only signed it, but they didn't ratify it. Oh. That's a good question for, as far as I know, they have ratified the, the, the agreement. Uh, yeah, they ratified the protocol, but not the, protocol. the convention itself. So the convention itself is incorporated into U.S. federal law instead of uh, ratifying it. They signed it, but they didn't ratify it. That is, but asylum is part of the immigration law, the immigration and nationality law. So I don't, know. I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm sorry. It's in U.S. law. It is in U.S. law. Well, oh, thank you very much for your presentation. I was uh, curious as to your interviews that you had mentioned some of your family helped you with at the shelter in Tijuana. Did you, did you have a chance to interview anyone who actually was interviewed by asylum officers and did they explain or share with you how they were treated along the interviews last? Did, did, they, did they get asked about the harm that they suffered? Well, my, my Karina, who's here, can talk about this yeah, first. Well, and she was going to talk, of course. <laughs> first, first, all of 
they do not only uh, Central Americans, but uh, uh, asylum seekers from different uh, parts of the world complain that the first thing that happens when they are uh, in US territory is that they are placed in what they call the hieleras, ice, ice baths. Those are cells that are very, very cold. And according to the Department of Homeland Security, they do that in order to avoid infections. Because when there is a, a cold uh, uh, temperature, a low temperature, then you cannot get sick by infection. That is the argument. <laughs> and, and then the light is on all the time. There is no food. And so definitely uh, all of the uh, people who we interviewed complain about the treatment in, 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 uh, before the, the credible fear uh, interview. In the case of Mexicans, I, I would say that their conditions are even worse because they can easily be deported because they are deported to Mexico. Central Americans cannot be deported to, to Mexico. They have to be sent to their countries of nationality. But we have interviewed many, many Mexicans from Michoacán and Guerrero who go to the interview early in the morning and by 5 p.m. they are back in the shelter with their application denied. Because it's very easy for them uh, to just uh, uh, send them to Mexico. What I don't know if there is that the, if they are formally deported with legal consequences for the future of if they are just returned with no legal consequences. As you know, in deportation, there are two different types of deportation. This is something that we still have to study. Thank you. Thanks for your question. I was actually at a shelter in Tucson, Arizona, in April, um, and a lot of the people that passed through there, that for the Tres Nogales, uh, there were a large number of indigenous Guatemalans. And there's been a lot of uh, articles in the New York Times about the over the court system and how they're overwhelmed with all these indigenous languages. So when I talked to some of these uh, these people, and I you know, really tried to not be too inquisitive, right, overstep my bounds. Um, they didn't really understand what was going to happen. You know, they didn't understand that they had to apply for asylum in order to remain in the U.S. And some people would actually just have outright tell me, I just came here to work. So um, I guess that my question is a few parts. One is, have you found uh, in your interviews a lot of people that don't really understand the legal process that's going to face them uh, in the U.S.? Two, do you know why so many indigenous Guatemalans are leaving? Is it is there a push or is there a pull? Is there something, is there, because I, I kind of get the feeling like there is something happening in the U.S. in these small towns, because a lot of them are heading not to the big cities, but to these really remote parts of the country, and uh, there are jobs waiting for them there. So I, I, my sense was that there was some cooperation on the ground with American uh, business owners, farm owners, poultry owners, whatever it was, and then, uh, Especially um, from women and 
and children units. Um, and then how can we reimagine a more just system to address these concerns in neighboring countries? Thank you. Uh, let me try to answer the question that you ask about people, if they know about the, the, the process of applying for asylum. I, I, I would say that Macrina will, will talk about a uh, man from Guatemala, I think, who, who wanted to cross the border illegally to the United States. And he was at Casa del Migrante. And he started talking to different other Central Americans, and they were saying, no, we're going to apply for asylum. And Macrina interviewed him one day. And he said, no, I'm going to try to cross the border illegally. And then a week later, he said, no, I'm going to apply for asylum. So definitely, definitely people talk and they share information. And definitely it is easier to apply for asylum than to try to cross the border illegally. Maybe I mean, not. Maybe not. Maybe not at the moment. You're right. The only thing that I know, and we know talking to lawyers from the otro lado and other, other lawyers is that and a lawyer from San Diego, a female lawyer, Mexican American, told us once, I stop giving advice. I never say again, don't apply because you're going to get in trouble. Because I have seen cases in which I didn't expect any, any good results and they were granted asylum. The interesting thing is that in this conversation in this discussion about uh, asylum seekers from Central America, we rarely talk about the origins of the conditions in Central America. We never talk about the intervention of the United States in the 1980s that sort of created this violent system. Because it seems that the many people in the U.S. think, well, that's a problem that uh, was created by these people. You know, I, I am very old, and I remember the 1980s, and I know about the intervention of the United States. Uh, only a few sociologists, uh, are actually a Salvadorian, Cecilia Menjibar, Menjibar, she has talked about this, because she, actually, she left El Salvador because of the war. And she knows that uh, the United States uh, participated in the creation of this violent system in Central America. Now, <clears throat> going back to your question, probably it would have been easier for the asylum seekers, the people in border cities, is that the, if the US government would have considered them as asylum seekers and not criminals like Trump uh, state, because the United States has the resources to put lots of uh, asylum officers in many border cities. Yeah, we, I know that. And I cross the border very often, and I see lots of agents doing nothing uh, on the U.S.-Mexican border. So they can, they can probably uh, interview everybody because they have the right I, I know that many people do not have a valid uh, reason to apply for asylum, or maybe, maybe, yes, they do. But the problem is that they, since they start with this movement of asylum seekers, the number one winner was Trump. Because with these large numbers of people coming to the United States, he portrayed that as an invention. As you know, he got a lot of political gains from this movement. But what can, what can Mexico do? What can the United States do? Treat people with respect and dignity and, and see if they really are, have problems in, in their countries. The only problem is that Mexico that cannot offer good conditions because the violence is a huge problem in Mexico. So there's an irony that uh, Mexico can become a safe third country because it's not safe.
Sorry, I don't want to hog the question. Um, I want to ask you a little bit of a different question. Um, I'm very impressed by the people in the community who are doing to volunteer to help, you know, with these shelters. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little more about how you think Mexican civil society is, how has it changed by this whole experience the last three or four years with so many people coming through Mexico. I read about shelters that exist not just on the border, but along the route, right, as well. Um, and it reminds me of work done in the United States by mostly religious groups um, who offer sanctuary in their churches or they offer services to uh, refugees and migrants, you know, undocumented people. Um, and so, you know, I, I, so I'm just curious how you think Mexican society has changed. Um, on the one hand, you have this support in organizations. On the other hand, as you mentioned, there's a lot of violence, there's gangs. Uh, those border cities are very unsafe because they are um, preyed upon. So if you could maybe just talk a little more about that, I'd love to hear. Thank you. Oh, thanks for, for your question. And no, and thanks for being here because Professor is a specialist on migration, and I'm glad. But not about this. I'm no, but you know a lot about migration, so thanks, thanks for coming here. Uh, I think that, the, of course, I, uh, since 2014, <coughs> Mexican society, especially in border cities, because in the rest of Mexico, people just pass by. But they arrive to border cities and they stay. I think that they have changed a lot of uh, different things in, in border cities. First, number one, and this is the negative aspect, we saw a different Mexico than we hadn't seen before. With these people opposing Central American immigration. And this is a very interesting um, question. Why, why they accept the Haitians and not the Central? Probably the idea that the Haitians are black and historically black people have been discriminated and they, they don't want to do that. And then the Central Americans are so alike. They, we look alike, we speak the same language. I don't know. It's, but there, there was some opposition to the Central Americans. But I would say that in general, Mexican society, this uh, process has made more people uh, aware that uh, they have to help you. And that is the case of Tijuana. Because you, you are right. There are these official uh, shelters. This Casa de Migrante was founded 33 or 34 years ago. But there are other shelters that have been created by people because they just wanted to help. And I have to mention some ladies in Veracruz, the state of Veracruz, where the famous uh, La Bestia, the train passes, Las Patronas. Those were very poor ladies in a little town that is located where the train makes a turn, so a curve, and as a result of that, they, they slow down a little bit. That allows them, they allow them to give them food and water to the people. And they were very, very poor. Little by little, they were getting support from other people because they wanted to help them to do that. And I think that Las Patronas is a very good example of what the Mexican society should be. But also it was a lot of opposition of the um, middle class, even with the acceptation of the asylum for Evo Morales. And I think it's because the same reason that here that they are saying that people are uh, competition, uh, they are going to take that job uh, because Lopez Obrador promises uh, give them to, to help them with money. So all these kind of things are um, created this uh, uh, same argument. Yeah, 
exactly the same, the same problem. I would like to um, just change it a little, change, change the focus a little um, to talk about United States domestic politics. Um, you correctly said that the winner in all of this has been Trump. And you talked about the caravan in um, the fall of 2018. And the irony is that in domestic politics, Trump constantly made um, reference in all his rallies to this caravan and the mating. And then uh, the Republican Party suffered massive losses in the November 2018 election. So the argument domestically didn't work. At least it didn't work to retain control of the House of Representatives. They didn't get control of the Senate, as we know, uh, which is why there hasn't been any change in policy. Um, but one has to hope, because I don't know how we go on if we don't know, that Trump's rhetoric has, has, not, has not affected more people um, and in the United States. You know, the whole caravan and the whole, I mean, we all know also that much of the hysteria about migration and immigration was a problem that he created um, that wasn't a problem. Uh, I mean, all of these, you know, he has this habit of creating problems that, that he then claims to solve. Um, so I'm looking at it from the American perspective and its impact on the uh, 2020 presidential election and congressional elections. And <clears throat> we, we have to hope that the arguments that he, he kept trotting out over and over again and then drop immediately after the election um, will no longer work for him and that we may hopefully see a change in the Senate uh, and the Democrats retaining the House of Representatives and God willing a change in the presidency so that some of these horrible uh, repercussions and policy um, and presidential uh, orders, which is a lot of this has been done by executive order, uh, will be reversed. That's, that's the only thing that, that keeps me going at this point. Thank you very much. And, and I would say, I didn't show this graph, but this is the number of apprehensions in the, on the U.S.-Mexico border between 1962 and 2019. Right, it went down. It wasn't a problem. Well, these are the years when most people were apprehended. Of course, they were single Mexican males who were returned in 40, 48 hours. But this is the, the, the number estimated for 2019, which is around 600,000. And also, Trump stopped the aid to the Central American countries. Exactly. I mean, that, that has to go next to that graph. Right, exactly. I mean, I wish you were right. There is another possibility that without exploiting the fear of migrants, actually they had a slogan, caravan and camera the Supreme Judge, and they would be the Latinosian. It could be that without that, they would have lost even more by the by, by the market. That, that's also a possibility. But I was going to say that what is intriguing, two things that are intriguing, why such a high proportion of Ethiopians get asylum when well, Ethiopia is a relatively peaceful country now. Uh -huh. I don't know that it's, there's any war or <laughs> and you said, what a lawyer, but I doubt that Ethiopians have money to uh, buy a lawyer, you know, pay a lawyer. So that's, that's, uh, that's intriguing, very intriguing. And the other one is the, the uh, positive relationship to Haitians, who seem to be mostly young men. And the, this is the demographic that creates more anxiety and fears, right? And Central Americans that are family and children, which is usually what we are more sympathetic and show more empathy, then it's not this, it, they show less solidarity to families and children than to young men that was a young. That's a very, usually, very important. Usually it's not, it, it's the other way around. Is it the size? Is it the size? Could be, I wonder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that could be that, you know, a few, are simpatico, thousands, maybe not too much. Hi, uh, 
The story is about one group that's been left out and they can speak. The ruling elites of those Central American countries that have made the conditions to stay wealthy based on the condition that brought the wrong people out. What accountability should you lay on them? You mean the, the, the political and economic elites in Central America? Of course, uh, they are also contributing to the economic and, and, and violence in those countries. I'm not an specialist on, the, on, on Central America, so I cannot tell you more about this, but uh, definitely I would say that, uh, that the conditions in, 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 in Honduras, for instance, the violence, is not only the result of the US intervention in the 1980s. There were a lot of other problems. Actually, an election a few years ago that was not uh, accepted by the US, and there was also another, uh, the support for the other candidate. But I'm sorry, but I agree with you that also the economic and political elites in each country are responsible. But you know, we keep on saying that uh, it's partly the result of US intervention in these areas, but the greatest US intervention was in Nicaragua. And no one is migrating from Nicaragua. And the least intervention was in Honduras. And most people are migrating from Honduras. Okay, that's another <laughs> Plus, there is a 30-year gap between the intervention and even, even the violence. If you look at homicide rates, they have been the, uh, declining, actually, when these migrations began. And they have been declining for six or seven years. So, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say that violence, when violence is declining, there is more. Well, very, very important yeah. points that we need yeah. to take into well, account. And then Jamaica also has a very high uh, Homicide rates, so people don't migrate from, maybe they go to the UK, I don't know. The, the very important thing with Professor Jose Moya is that he studies migration from all over the world. So he knows. Not only that, it's interplanetary too. <laughs>